Thank you for joining the Institute of Certified Investment and Financial Analysts webinar. I'm F.A. Diana Murioki Maina, the CEO of the Institute of Certified Investment and Financial Analysts. Welcome, ISIFA members. We also have several guests joining us uh, today, this evening. And for the sake of our guests, that is the ISIFA NAN members, please allow me to introduce ISIFA, the Institute of Certified Investment and Financial Analysts. So ISIFA is a professional body established under the Investment and Financial Analyst Act, whose main mandate is to register and license certified investment and financial analysts that is in Kenya. So that is just a brief introduction about ISIFA. Kindly visit isifa.co.ke for more information about ISIFA. So back to today's webinar, and I'd want to recognize that these are indeed tough times, I'm sure you all are aware. This COVID-19 pandemic has really hit us hard, whether it is in our businesses, in our, in our households, at individual levels, we are all undergoing some challenging times, but it is also a time to display hope, courage, generosity, and kindness. So far, we have heard a lot being talked about health, mental health. We've heard a lot being talked about education, but I think we have not talked so much about money. And today, I think uh, it's good that we need to talk about money and more importantly, how to grow money given the current challenges. I'm sure some are even living from hand to mouth or we've been wondering, uh, some have taken pay cuts, how can I even save, how can I say invest during these current times? So it's important we have this discussion around how we can assist and engage and we'll be mainly focusing on investment basics and what one needs to consider to make better investment decisions. As I said, some may not really know even where the savings can come from, how they can even invest. So we hope that you'll be able to address these issues. And I have to tell you, we have a very great panel who will delve into the subject matter and will educate us on tips for choosing the right savings and investment options. And there are two, I can say there are two types of audiences here. The INSIFA members, maybe for them, they're thinking we should be talking about investment expert type of uh, discussion. But we also want to communicate to the members on how better can they communicate to the public out there. Sometimes investment terminologies can involve a lot of jargon. So how can we simplify for someone to have a better understanding in, invest, in investments and also to the public out there, there's someone who has no clue about investment, how to make better investment decisions. So we'll be addressing these two types of audiences today. And uh, as I said, we have a great panel with us today and kindly allow me to introduce the panel today. I will introduce the panel shortly. Allow me to share the screen. So we have with us our first panelist, that is F.A. Elizabeth Irungu, who is also a CFA charter holder. She's the General Manager Business Development and Client Relations at ICA Lion Asset Management. She's a seasoned fund manager with over 14 years industry experience. She's currently, as uh, so already said, she's the general manager of ICA Lion Asset Management. She holds a master's degree in economics and is a CFA, I mentioned that. She's also very passionate about financial wellness and enjoys writing articles and trainings in this area. She's also a member of ISIFA. Next, we have, uh, next, sorry, there's a bit of a challenge. We have F.A. Samuel Gishohi. He is the Head of Business Development at NCBA Investment Bank. He has over 11 years of experience in investment banking with a focus on equity markets, private placements, and capital issues. He is also an avid champion in the promotion and delivery of financial literacy programs in Kenya and East Africa. He is uh, 
He previously worked as a senior research analyst at uh, NIC Securities. He holds an MSc in finance from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland, UK, and an, 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 an advanced diploma in information technology from the Institute of Finance Management in Tanzania. And I'm happy that he actually recognizes his member number, FA00399, ISIFA member, confirmed. Thank you, FA Samuel. So uh, I'd like to talk a bit about our some housekeeping matters for today's forum. Uh, and uh, we'd like to recognize our attendees today. We already have 102 who have joined us. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. We hope that you will learn a lot and you will be engaged throughout the session. So some housekeeping matters, kindly just uh, sending any questions under the Q&A. I believe we'll also be live on YouTube. We'll still, we'll try as much as we can to address both the questions on YouTube and the questions on the Zoom platform. So kindly send in your questions under Q&A and not on the chat section at the bottom of your screen. YouTubers, you can still, you can chat as we go along. So the structure mainly of today's uh, webinar will involve a brief presentation. We want to have a better understanding just to, to have like a, what do you call it, a practice session of what to expect in the panel discussion. And uh, the presentation will be done by FA Elizabeth. And thereafter, immediately we'll have a panel discussion of 30 minutes and we'll leave a lot of the questions we well, will allow our attendees to ask as many questions as possible to have a better understanding. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, if Elizabeth Irungo to just give a brief uh, presentation on investment basics and what to consider before investing. Welcome, if Elizabeth. Thank you, Diana, and good evening to everybody. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar. I'm going to share with you uh, some basics about investments. We won't go very deep into detail because of the time and because also I believe that uh, most of you are very uh, knowledgeable in this area. So I'll, I'll try as much as possible not to, not to bore you with a lot of jargon. So uh, if you can see my screen, um, I'm just going to expand that. And we'll start off, like you've heard, uh, my name is Elizabeth. I work, with, uh, I work with ICLI on asset management. ICA is one of the uh, big recognized uh, fund managers in Kenya, and we're very proud to be in this space, offering financial services to, the, to everybody, and uh, professionally for that matter, and uh, also ethically. So I'm very happy to represent the brand ICA Lion and welcome all. I'll not take any further um, you know, intro, so let me go uh, straight into the investment basics, the concepts that we want to look, uh, to, to, to look at to, today. So basically we're asking ourselves this evening, why do we invest? How do you invest? What do you invest in? Basically, and, and creating some form of awareness of ourselves because it's very important that as you start your investment journey or as you continue with wherever you are at, uh, you're aware of how you're investing and that is how professionals and uh, those successful investors uh, make it in their lives. Uh, so just to, uh, uh, to kick us off, uh, I'd like to go through six considerations that you should always evaluate uh, before you make any investments. So first, we look at your investment horizon. What is that? What is a horizon? We know a horizon. We know, for, for me, a horizon always reflects a sunset or something like that, something which is quite far away or, 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 or something like that. Uh, but in investments, when you look at investment horizon, you either have a short-term horizon, a medium-term horizon, a long-term hor horizon. And basically, we are saying if you're an individual, you look at your age, it will tell you how long you have. God keeping us, how long do you have uh, till uh, your end of days? And uh, we are saying, yeah, for a 70-year-old and a 20-year-old, the two are not the same and their investment styles will definitely be very different. For the 70-year-old, they're going to be a little bit more conservative. They're going to preserve because they are not at the, uh, at the time where they are uh, making a lot of income. 
uh, but for a young person, you can actually experiment, you can take risky uh, investments and risky decisions because it is possible for you to recover. But if you give a retiree or somebody who has stopped working and uh, they're relying on their incomes that they earned uh, in their uh, in their years, earlier years, then you're going to mislead them. So depending on your age, then you determine what kind of investment term or horizon are we talking about. And uh, that's not all in, the, in terms of horizon. It talks about uh, if it is monies, are you looking at monies that you need for maybe a project that is coming up very soon and that will make it short term? Or are you looking at investing for your retirement, which would make it uh, more long term? Is it an emergency fund and things like that? But investment horizon is very, very important that you start by understanding how long do you want to invest these monies that you have already uh, set aside for investment. Then the other consideration that you'd have to look at is your risk appetite. And I know in Kenya, when you talk about risk, many times when I talk to investors about risk, they think about, I'm going to lose the money. But investments, we are talking about risk, is a volatility. Are you ready to see the up and down and to live with, the, with the, uh, uh, an investment that could go up, the valuation could go up or come down? That's the kind of risk we are talking about. Of course, there's the risk of uh, credit risk and maybe uh, you don't ever recover from that. But a lot of times it is the movement of the prices and the fact that maybe if you wanted the money back at a certain point, then you might not be able to get the price that maybe that had traded yesterday. Case in point, if you're in the property market, uh, I know the last couple of years I've seen prices come off. So if somebody had uh, invested in a plot with the hope that they will double their money, maybe they'll not do it as they would have done it maybe five years ago. So you find that there's uh, that volatility and that movement of pricing and uh, in your investment. So very important to understand your risk appetite. There are those of us who are created to be conservative and the conservatives are those ones who are saying, ah, I do not like seeing my money uh, fluctuate so much. If I have a million, I just want to remain a millionaire. Do not tell me tomorrow you're not a millionaire. So that's a conservative person. And the way you look at the risk and return is that the higher the risk, uh, the, the, the higher the return, the lower the risk, uh, and also the, the returns ca comes down. There are those who are moderate, those are balanced people, and that is where majority of us fall in. Uh, we are moderate, we're looking at investments that uh, promise us a fairly uh, good return, but uh, not excessive. And then there are those who can go aggressive and take really aggressive uh, strategies towards their portfolios uh, that will promise high returns. But in the event that markets turn uh, or, uh, or factors change, they could also see the downside coming and hitting them uh, fairly uh, badly. And here we are saying, he who is not courageous enough to take risk will accomplish nothing in life. And why I picked that quote by Muhammad Ali is because uh, for every investment you take, can guarantee you there's a risk in it. I know many times we go to we, we go into investment and you're told, I'm guaranteeing you a return. And most people go walking with their heads high and they can say, I have a guarantee. But many, many times there are risks that are embedded to the returns that we look out for or we invest in. So very important for you to understand yourself. Why are you conservative? Are you moderate? Are you aggressive? in the way you uh, understand risk. And also with your age. For an aged person, I would say, don't chase risk because you're chasing very high returns at a time when you should be conserving whatever you have already earned. So risk appetite for the older people will be lower. Risk appetite for a younger person should be a little more aggressive. I get worried that uh, in our Kenyan scenario, I meet a lot of young people who want high return, but they want low risk. Uh, a bit of a convoluted way of thinking. From today onward, I think we need to align ourselves and say, uh, you, you're looking for high returns, also accept some level of moderate risk uh, to your portfolio. Uh, then the third thing that I would want us to look at is the investment return goal. You need to understand your investment return goal. So what is it? Uh, what kind of return are you looking out for? And it's very important. You never go uh, to hunt without a target in mind. Do you want to take home a big uh, piece of pie or just a small one so that you conserve everything? And here we are talking about uh, those who want to preserve capital. Those who are saying, 
I've already made money. I want to conserve my capital. I want to preserve it by all means. That's a, a goal that one can have to preserve their capital and just moderately grow it. And there are those who are going to look for cash flows. And this means continuously they want to see cash coming in. Uh, for such kind of clients and for such kind of investors, you're looking at uh, investments that can give you uh, steady cash flows. And those ones come from fixed income particularly. You would not be looking at equities because uh, equities, dividends are decided by, uh, by, by boards of directors. Let's take a case, a uh, uh, classic case. This year, uh, most people who had invested in equities we were anticipating or they were anticipating dividends, but we've seen some companies hold back on paying, paying out dividends because of COVID, and they've said they're going to plow back that cash. So equities may not give you that cash flow uh, uh, plan that you, are, you, you may want if you're chasing or you're looking, at, uh, looking out for cash flow as a return. Then capital growth. And those who are looking at growing and multiplying their wealth and, and their capital. So if you're starting with a million shillings, they're saying in 10 years, I want my money to be maybe five, five times more. So the multiple that you get with your capital growth will only come with a higher risk investments, uh, particularly things which are more associated with equities and uh, capital uh, investments like, uh, like properties. Those ones can give you large capital growth uh, especially if they are fundamentally strong, then those those of those of us who are investing with a goal to hedge inflation, you don't want inflation to eat into your monies, and that should be for all of us. For whatever investment you take, should always take into consideration consideration the inflation rate because inflation comes to eat into the value of your money, meaning that your monies cannot buy the same amount of goods uh, tomorrow. So if you do not hedge against inflation then your investments are, are actually not uh, protecting you as a nascent investor. Then there are those who want speculative capital growth. And this is very unique. There are those who are saying, I want to, spec to, to speculate on a certain uh, investment. And uh, it, so for some, it is a goal. But I would say, be very careful with speculative capital growth, because if things don't turn out the way you're looking, then the speculation may actually uh, become a pain point for you and may, hind may hinder you from making further investments. Uh, then you go to the another consideration called liquidity. What are your liquidity needs? And in liquidity, we are talking about how much money do you need? Well, how, how quickly do you need your money back? Is it money for school fees? Like now we're in a season where most of us have not paid school fees, but schools will reopen after all. So you've got some cash maybe you've put aside. Uh, that, I would call it hot money. If that is hot money, then do not go seeking risk with such money because the liquidity need is high from that money. You need it back as uh, fast as the liability falls due because you need to, uh, to pay your fees and not to worry about maybe you bought a share and now the share price has gone down and therefore the value of your investment has come down. Then there's money that you could be having that is patient. And patient money is money that you can be able to invest into and uh, uh, invest and hold for a long time awaiting the value to unlock this is money that you can be able to put in things like equities equity prices yes they move every day but it is very hard for you to time equities and see them just rise significantly so you need to have patient money that can actually await uh, for the company's valuations to keep on going going up, or even things like property. You don't want to buy a property and then the next thing, uh, in, in one year you're asking, let me sell. I know in Kenya people have made money with such kind of strategies, but ordinarily that is just uh, that is more of luck than the strategy in such kind of investments so here again i'm saying our life goals will dictate the liquidity needs of our investments and so it's very important to understand our goals if i'm saving towards education i need to understand that i can't take too much risk because education first of all it's something to unlock more value for me and it's an investment by itself then we move on to another consideration as we seek to understand ourselves, understand your tax 
status. Are you a taxable person? Are you tax exempt? Uh, if you're a foreigner or uh, uh, an entity that is operating in Kenya or investing in another jurisdiction, what tax agreements are existing between countries? Because it's one thing to invest and then only to realize whatever you had gone in investing, the taxman has come and chopped off a big chunk of it. So, for example, uh, I can, we, 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 can, we can talk about investments that are suitable for tax, taxable persons. Uh, in Kenya, we've got uh, tax-exempt bonds. Uh, in other countries, we, we, uh, we also have such kind of investments. Uh, we've got also uh, investors coming to Kenya, and you need to understand if you're a foreigner, what kind of taxes apply for a foreigner and for a local person? And uh, is it is a tax even final? or is it only a portion and therefore at the end of the year, uh, you need to actually top up. For example, is it is withholding tax uh, final? And we know that for Kenyans, uh, this is final. And so it is a good thing that when you invest in most of our uh, in instruments uh, in Kenya, withholding tax will be final for individuals and therefore does not attract a higher tax bracket. Uh, then the other thing and the final consideration that you should have as an individual is, uh, is your speciality. Your, what's special about you? Each one of us is unique. We are masterpieces created by God in our own way. So what is special about you that maybe when you're investing, you need to consider? There are those of us who have very strong values based on our faith. We are, we, are, we are of different faiths. There are those who are Muslims, they are Hindus, they are Christians. And our faiths dictate how we invest. So I'll, for example, if you're a Muslim person, you find that they will not invest in uh, alcoholic drinks, even if those uh, alcoholic uh, companies are doing very well. And that's their faith. It is okay. And it's okay to honor your faith because even in investments, it's possible to honor the values that you stand out for. Environmental, social, and governance considerations are also another consideration many people are taking into place into consideration before investing. If you have a company that uh, does not take care of the environment, would you want to support them by investing in their shares? Most likely not. There are those who are very strongly opposed to such kind of things, and it's good to consider uh, the uh, associations of what these companies are doing. And uh, things like social and, and governance considerations also, you need to consider them. Then there's ethical investments. We have companies that invest, uh, for example, uh, in uh, weapons and uh, armory. Uh, are you comfortable going into such investments or don't you care for any of all these? And therefore you tell your investment manager, buy anything as long as it makes me money. So, but it is important that you take into consideration your personal preferences, which are very important because when you are aligned in your portfolio, even yourself, you sleep better every day. That's the first part of, our, uh, of my presentation today, looking at ourselves, creating awareness and the profiling ourselves is a profile of who you are and how you would want to invest your monies and understanding yourself before even you go into the market to look for those investments. Then quickly, I'll look at the investment options that are available, uh, both locally and, 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 and abroad. Uh, and our investment options are many. There are so many. We, have, we cannot even exhaust them. So starting off, with the cash and the cash equivalent. Uh, we've got things like bank deposits, commercial papers, certificates of deposit, money market funds and treasury bills. All those fall into your cash and cash equivalent. And as the name suggests, they are liquid investments. They are easily accessible. They will most likely not tie you into a contract for more than one year. So you can be able to get your money back quite quickly when you need it. So they are short term and they are liquid in nature and they will be uh, mostly less than one year in maturity. The risk type in this kind of uh, investment, low to moderate. I put there moderate because we've got things like commercial papers, which will depend on the company that you have lent your money to. And therefore, you may have uh, you may have had, like in Kenya, there's some commercial papers that have gone back, past, like the Tritons and things like that. Uh, so when you look at that, that was not even low risk. That could have been rated high risk. So very important to consult your investment manager to understand the level of risk that 
each of these have even bank deposits. Not all banks are same. So we hear even our own governor telling us some are tier one, some are tier two, some are tier three. What's all that? It's very good to understand. And your manager would be able to give you more color to that before making investments and just deciding that maybe a bank deposit is always a low risk. It, it, is, a, it, it is a spectrum between low and moderate risk. Then the return from this kind of investments you'll get low to moderate returns. If you're buying treasury bills, they're the lowest risk type of uh, investments in this category. They will not give you the highest returns. If you are from Uganda, forgive me because I know your re returns in your treasury bills, they are looking quite up and uh, you may found like uh, we, we are talking different things when you have double digit numbers there, uh, but basically, they are low risk. Uh, treasury bills should be giving you the lowest and then the others keep on adding up because of the risk. Every risk that you take should be compensated. So if you move to a bank deposit, you should be able to get a little better than treasury bill. If you come to a money market fund, you should get better than a treasury bill. And the same applies to commercial papers and certificates of deposit. And treasury bonds, these are more long term beyond one year, they are mostly issued by governments. So that's why they are called treasury bonds. You know, uh, governments that are always are looking for money to fund their budgets and deficits that they may have. So these are good instruments that are issued by governments and they are considered low risk or moderate risk and largely not because of default, uh, because of it the interest rate risk. The interest rate risk uh, here will uh, account for the fact that when you come to trading, you may find that uh, rates have gone up and therefore the valuation of your bond has come down. So there's um, some level of uh, loss of value because of uh, the interest rate movements and other factors that may come into play. The return profile will be moderate depending on the uh, maturity of the bond that you buy. If you buy a 25 year bond, you're more likely to be rewarded higher than person who buys a two year bond. So the profile will be different for different maturities for these bonds. Then you've got corporate bonds. And these are instruments or fixed income instruments issued by companies or corporates uh, to raise capital. They are sources of capital for, uh, for, for these corporates. So corporates can borrow from banks or they can come to the market and raise bonds. And I'm sure most of us have come across uh, companies, that, companies that were raising capital uh, through a bond. And these ones come in uh, with all sizes and types of risk and uh, return between moderate and uh, high risk. And you see uh, corporate bonds from um, companies that are not doing uh, spectacularly well, they should be paying you higher returns than those companies which are solid and strong and really uh, uh, firm in, their, in the way they are doing their business. So you find that the risk profile will be between moderate and high risk. Then uh, the return profile uh, will be moderate and sometimes you can get high returns from junks. And, uh, but here we are not about to discuss about junk bonds, but they fall into this category of corporate bonds. Then listed equities, this is the darling, and I know someone will talk a lot about this one uh, because it's been in this market for so long. Uh, these are shares or, or stocks of companies listed in a stock exchange, uh, for example, in the Nairobi Securities Exchange. So you find, uh, stocks of companies, different companies have come and raised capital uh, through the exchange and we can be able to trade their shares, buy and sell their shares. Uh, the risk profile of uh, listed equities is moderate to high risk. They are those who, with companies which we have said fundamentally, they are very strong. They are operating in a, a maybe in a segment that is performing very well. The governance is very strong and the outlook and the strategy looks really good. You find that those ones may give you fairly uh, moderate uh, risk in terms of uh, in terms of risk profiling, but there are those ones which are also not really uh, understandable. Maybe you can't even see the future very well, and that is what we would say. They are a more high risk, and the return profile will also uh, range between moderate and high. Moving on. We've got unlisted or private equity shares. These are shares of companies uh, uh, which are not listed. So companies which are not in the exchange, they can also issue uh, shares to investors. We've got quite a number of those companies, I think, in our country with only 70 or less companies which are listed in the exchange. You can imagine all the other companies are private. So private companies can also issue shares and you can be able to invest in those ones. 
the big thing about these ones and what you need to know is that they're not easily tradable, so they are illiquid. And so by that illiquidity, their risk profile will always be, uh, uh, be, be, be rated as high. So we say this one's because of the unlisting element, you're, able, you're not able to, to unlock or know the valuation of these shares as easily as you would know the ones which are listed, then we say uh, they, the risk uh, profile is actually high. And the return would also be uh, quite high. They should be returning better than the listed ones. Uh, but obviously that is not a rule of the thumb. Sometimes you find even unlisted shares performing worse than, uh, uh, the, than the listed ones. And so it's very important that you dig into numbers, you understand the companies very well because every time we buy into a company, you're buying into their future strategy, you're buying into their future success. So if you can't see the success, then whether listed, whether unlisted, then the returns will reflect that reality. Then we move on to real estate, property, and infrastructure assets, and I've bumped them together. Real estate, property, infrastructure, this is where your plot is, uh, if you own a plot. Uh, and this type of immovable um, assets, they are good hedge to inflation. They are long-term, uh, they are capital intensive, Many times you'll have to put in much more money than buying a share. Sometimes a share is only 20 shillings. But if you are going to invest in real estate and property, definitely have to put a little more than that. You dig deeper. So they are more capital intense in nature. And, the, and, and, and for infrastructure, in our country, Kenya, we find that infrastructure assets are just coming uh, on board. We still do not have anything that we can say tangibly is infrastructure, but government is very keen that soon and very soon. Uh, will be able to invest in uh, something like a road. I know in Tanzania there are bridges that are already that, that are already assets that are investable by um, the public. So very good uh, opportunity to deploy capital in areas that are not easily uh, achievable, like infrastructure assets. They are large in other countries. They are developing in our country. Uh, the risk profile will range between moderate to high risk, and this will also depend on the structure of that particular type of investment that you're buying. And then the return should be moderate to high, it should be rewarded because you are going to invest for long and you're going to commit your funds for a longer period and for um, in, a, in a riskier uh, investment. All right, I'll move to the next one. And this one looks a little busy. Uh, collective investment schemes. These are schemes that pull together money and aggregate investors with similar investment uh, objectives. And therefore, when we come together as investors, we enjoy the economies of scale, the professional management of our monies, and we are seeking to achieve one goal. And therefore, we have that uh, uh, safety investing in a scheme that is either regulated or unregulated. You may have come across these ones, money market funds, bond funds, equity fund, real estate REITs, that's REITs, that's what I mean, balance funds, property funds, which are maybe not even listed, and anything can be put into a collective investment scheme as long as you bring in investors with a similar investment objective and therefore they are able to put small amounts or large amounts and all of them share into the benefits of that uh, particular investment scheme. The risk type will therefore be a full spectrum. Some are low risk, others will go to the high risk uh, spectrum uh, depending on what is underlying. So like money markets would be on my low risk and then when you have the types of equity funds, the types of uh, real estate funds, we'll put, more, we'll put them more to the uh, other extreme of your risk profile. Then the return profile will still be the same, low, medium, high, and it will mean that you need to understand what kind of collective investment scheme you're buying into uh, when you're investing uh, so that you understand what kind of risk the CIS has and what kind of return you anticipate from such kind of an investment. Moving on, alternative assets. And these ones are many. I have not even exhausted. I have just listed a few of them. Alternative assets will range from gold, commodities, and you know commodities have so many commodities. We've got 
so much in this world. I think we can never uh, exhaust whatever God created. Commodities, cryptocurrency, funds of funds, hedge funds, asset-backed securities, and much more. The reason they're called alternative is that they're not your usual cup of tea or your usual cup of coffee. So these ones need a lot more of understanding before you buy copper. Do you even know what copper does? Before you buy titanium or things like that, it's very good to understand that market. So there are alternative assets which are not your regular uh, kind of investment. They are good. Cryptocurrencies, they came. I know there was a hype when we were buying uh, crypto and everybody wanted crypto, even if they did not understand what crypto was doing or does. Is, is it a bad investment? I know CMA said, do not invest. But uh, you know what? In the rest of the world, people were investing. So all these alternative assets that you need to be careful when you are investing and you need to get better understanding as you invest in them. They are unique and they focus on non-traditional assets. Uh, the risk profile will range between low and very high risk. It is your cryptocurrency going all the way to some high price and then crashing in one minute and everybody is crying the next minute people are happy and things like that then your low risk is like gold if you just choose gold surely i think you can stay safe in your gold and then your return profile for this will obviously range between low and very high returns I finished talking about the different types of investments that you can take. Uh, of course, there are very there are, there are many more that I've not covered. Uh, you can invest more time with your fund manager or with your investment advisor to understand them. Uh, moving on, how do you manage? Fine, you've bought a portfolio now. How would you manage this portfolio? I'd say once you create a portfolio, consider all factors before constructing or rebalancing your portfolio always refer to your personal investment profile understand you and then now don't follow the hard don't follow what uh, harry is doing and the rest do what fits you and the only way you can follow you is when you understand you you profile yourself and therefore <clears throat> you end up with a better uh, portfolio at the end of the day always maintain a diversified portfolio it's very easy for people to say, for investors to say, for me, plots have always worked. I'll only invest in plots. But that is such a shallow way of looking at your portfolio. Try and diversify your portfolio. Look at it holistically and buy from the different so, uh, types of investment so that you have diverse portfolio with maybe equities, with government bonds, with short-term investment, uh, with some property in there. And all that is will make a more successful portfolio than when you have a skewed one that is just made up of one type of investment. Uh, so your eggs should not be in one basket. Be objective in your decision making. Use validated data to make your decisions. And if you don't have the data, use your professional advisor for get to get such kind of data. Fund managers are available to give you such kind of uh, information. So objective decision making is very important rather than rumors. There are always rumors being peddled left, right, center. Be sure that you're not operating with rumors so that uh, you make speculative uh, decisions, rather make decisions that are hinged on uh, fundamentals. Avoid panic. When you come to investments, you've got to develop a thick skin. You cannot afford to make panic decisions. For example, when COVID happened, there was panic and I remember, and I know you guys must have watched how Dow Jones just crashed. It crashed and the market had to be uh, halted. Things that, just because investors really panicked. So we should avoid panic uh, decisions and make decisions after we have sobered up. And this next slide just talks about that. Is it when the crisis comes, do you fight? Is it flight? What's your response mechanism? Be sure that you're not the type who will make those responses that you regret later. So understand yourself. Do not follow euphoria. Do not make panic decisions because even when things look bad, 
be still turned around. Nothing lasts forever. And your psychology uh, will really help you in making investment decisions that are solid. So finally, to close it up, for all of us who are aspiring to be good investors, we don't have to be smarter than the rest. We have to be more disciplined than the rest. That's what Warren Buffett tells us. So let's make smarter, uh, let's make disciplined investments and we will look like we are the smarter investments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, back to you. Oh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you for that great uh, presentation. As I said, sometimes investments can involve a lot of uh, jargon or some terminology, terminologies that you may not really be able to understand. So we appreciate Elizabeth and now we'll move on to our panel discussion. The purpose really is how we can simplify communicating about investments. As I said, sometimes there's that perception that investment belongs to some elite club. Uh, there's someone who was joking when an investment analyst talks about PE just to a common man and she, someone will wonder what is PE. Is it physical education? What, what exactly are you talking about? So we hope that now this panel discussion will be able to simplify some of the terminologies and help or rather educate the public, specifically our non-members. I know our members are investment experts, but specifically the non-members want to, at least we're talking about money, we want to talk about how to grow money, which is really what investing is. So I'll move over to our panel discussion. We'll just have a brief uh, panel discussion. And as we move along, we'll answer some questions uh, that we are seeing some questions coming in. I mentioned that you can send in your questions on Q&A just at the bottom of your screen. And I want to apologize. There has been a technical hitch. We hope to be live on uh, YouTube. However, there are a bit of some things that we need to sort out. However, we'll still upload all the content on YouTube for the sake of those who may miss a thing or two or who are looking forward to watch us on YouTube. So watch out for that. We'll upload immediately after that. So as I said, uh, please send in your questions under Q&A not on chat because it's easier to follow and, in, and to answer under Q&A. So I'll begin with Elizabeth. You've talked a bit about uh, some investment options. You've highlighted some investment options. So I'd want to ask maybe for the sake of uh, just the general public, why should one invest and how can one know that they are ready to invest? based on some investment op options that you have talked about. Elizabeth? All right, thank you, Diana. I think investment is meant for everybody because we all desire quality life. And investments come to improve our quality, the quality of our lives. So it shouldn't be a preserve for some. So we should be seeing all of us from a young age striving to become investors and improving our investment skills. So we invest so that we achieve goals, we improve our life, um, our, our quality, the quality of our lives. And that way, in future, you are going to live a better life than if you consume everything. Uh, investments are form part of savings, your savings, and the, you're saving for the future. You're simply postponing consumption today to consuming in the future, and probably you'll consume a better meal than if you consumed it today. Diana. Thank you very much for that, uh, Elizabeth. And it's true, it's not only for elite, anyone is entitled to invest. So I'd want to ask uh, F.A. Samuel, I know there was a discussion we had during one of our previous forums and we were talking about compound interest and you know that uh, growing money, that the compound interest is really likened to growing money. So in simplified terms, how would you explain to a common manangi what compound interest is really and how it will help them to grow money? Atakama, you'll talk in Kiswahili, in mother tongue, how, how can you communicate? 
Well, um, thank you. Uh, interesting perspective. Um, sometimes compound interest can easily be explained by just looking at even um, agriculture. I mean, look at our goods, or if, you, if it is your maize, you're growing, you grow uh, above, uh, you, you have a goat or two goats, and those two goats get a young goat. And then a year later, because you didn't sell the young goat, what happens is the young goat will probably now become a mother. And so it means now you have two goats that can give birth, which means now in a year, if each goat gives birth to two, go two goats, it means now you're getting four in a year. Now next year, you're going to, to have six goats, which actually not six. You're going to have the four new ones and you're going to have the two. Yes, you have six, which means those six will give birth to two each, which means now you're going to get 12 new ones. So you can see every year you have more 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 goods that are giving birth to even more and that's compound interest because what warren buffett called this is um, he, he called it the the eighth wonder of the world and the reason he called it is because it has what we call a snowball effect if you buy something for 10 shillings or if you say put money in a bond that is giving you 10 percent and then next year you don't use that 10 percent and you let that 10 percent remain within the bond, then it will earn 10%, which 10%, you say the initial bond was 100 shillings, it earned you 10%, which was 10 shillings. Next year, you have 110 shillings earning 10%, which means you're going to earn 11 shillings. So going on like that, you're going to realize that eventually, the amount that you're earning in interest will become equal or even bigger than what you put in initially, because you are allowing or reinvesting all the money that you're making. So this is very good for long-term investment investors. What happens with us a lot of the time is I will put my uh, 1,000 shillings and when I get the 100 shillings, I'm very happy because as an investor, I have made that 10% say dividend and I take that 10% and I spend it. Now when I spend it, I've taken it out of investment and so it is not earning me money. The idea of compound interest is letting your money work for you. I hope I've explained it in a way that making your money work for you that's very clear somewhere and thank you for that example with the with the goods i'm sure that can that is something that can be very applicable even to people machine money. that's a great explanation so based on that and even warren buffett said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world what do you think then uh, now that we may have knowledge of compound interest how to grow money what are some of the common mistakes that people make uh, when it comes? What do you think are some of the common mistakes that people make when it comes to investing? Still on you, Samuel. So, is Samuel, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, just a moment. I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I think some of the common mistakes, of course, that we ha we make is, as we heard from uh, Elizabeth, is that we put one all our eggs in one basket, which means we put all our money in, uh, in, in say, and uh, my friends from Central, we have uh, the problem of plots, for example. So we have a plot everywhere. I have a plot in uh, Katarani. <laughs> you can plot Maguta Maguta somewhere else. And we have plots all over the place. We are not doing anything with these plots. And remember, we just take our children, they walk around the plot, and we walk around thinking we have many plots. But what happens, for example, in this COVID-19 time, when the real estate sector, or say you are in all, everything is in rentals, and now everybody in rentals is not being paid rent. It means that you are stuck. You're not making any money from investment. and that means you have put all your money or all your eggs in one basket if the basket falls you're in trouble um the other example you're going to see for example in stocks uh, in stocks you see somebody come and say because i was a banker i worked for a bank i trust banks so i only buy within the banking sector now what happens when the cre the interest rate capping happens it means that all the banking stocks went down and if you are sitting in the banking space alone and you didn't have anything in manufacturing or in, any, or in any other sector, then you went down with the whole the market. So again, that is one of the most dangerous mistakes we make. The other mistake we make is we do things that we don't understand 
just because somebody else is doing did it. And I, I don't know if you have noticed that uh, in our investment, and when we talk about these things, let's not just think about them and, and like shares, because again, in real life, go down Moy Avenue, somebody opened a shop selling telephone accessories. And then the next minute, everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry decides that this is the business that you want, and you go to all those stores, and everybody sells the same thing. So at the end of the day, you have the competition is very high. You are fighting for the same thing. And so you're all doing something because someone else did it. But don't forget, you don't even understand how they succeeded. They know somebody is probably an electrician or whatever, and they know, they understand that business, and that's why they're doing it. You, you're coming and doing it just because someone else did it, or because you had someone else talking about it. Um, the had, and we have had Elizabeth talking about it, is something that most people do. People don't ask questions or try to understand, why am I investing in something? Why am I putting my money in this thing? Um, we follow the heart. The moment you see people running in one direction, you've seen it when we are hit with tear gas, we all run in one direction, but the guy who's, who doesn't even know why everyone is running also runs with the crowd. They don't know why they're running. And I believe you should run only long enough to ask the guy who's running with you, why are you running? They'll probably tell you it's raining on the other side. And you can quickly jump into a shop, buy umbrellas, and start selling them. I don't know if you've noticed how those hookers just appear on the street. They're thinking differently from the heart. They're saying, oh, it's raining. Okay, jump into the Indian shop, tell him, give me 10 umbrellas. pesa." So again, these are certain ways that we need to think um, to avoid making mistakes. The other issues and the big mistakes we make, and I'm just going to use these two. One is, is greed, and the other one is fear. If you ask most people what they fear or, 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 or how greed works is very simple. Um, I'll use Safaricom, which was a very simple example. Safaricom came to the market at five shillings. Two days after Safaricom came to the market, it went to eight shillings. That's a 30, uh, actually that is a, that was a 60% gain in two days, meaning every, each day it gained around 30%. If you annualize that, even without putting the compound interest we talked about earlier, that's over 12,000% gain in a year. Now, you call that same person and say, man, sell this thing. You've just made 80% in two days. They tell you, it's a panda panda. Now, what happens is later, of course, it started to come down. And uh, so you lose an opportunity because you're not able to buy with an objective. And we always say, never buy anything that you do not know what you're willing to sell it at. Because when the point comes when you should sell it and you didn't decide before you bought it, what you wanted to sell it at, then you're not going to sell it because you're going to get greedy. That is setting an objective. The other one is fear. I always ask people, what do you fear when you invest? Most people will say the fear losses. Then you ask them, then why did you buy, say, Safari when it was 55? That was hard effect. They were buying it because everyone else had bought it and had made money already. The only person who brags about making money to you at your local pub or wherever you are, is the person who has already made money. So if you're already hearing it from somebody who's already made money, then it means it's probably too late for you to be investing in that. And the, that, this is a concept. It's called the fear of losing out. We don't fear to lose. We fear to lose out. I'll use Lehman's language here. When you're buying a beautiful scarf, uh, like the one you have there, I think, Diana, um, what does the vendor tell you? They tell you, zilikuwa tatu, lakini hii diya musho. In fact, somebody wanted it. In fact, And then what happens is they will they will even pick a phone call and say, oh, in fact, this is the guy who wanted it. How does Diana react? She calls the next guy and tells him, hey, chief, you lend me money, I buy. You'll buy that scarf for 3000 only to walk out on the street, and everybody on the street has it, and they bought it for 2000 It's called the fear of losing out. It's not fear of losing. The matatu tout who tells you your musho mia knows that. They know you're going to get into the matatu without asking somebody, is this the time that the last matatu leaves? Of course, in these times of coffee, it's a different story. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for that, Samuel. I think you've taught us two new things. Huh? Follow. There's a new acronym on my phones, Aleo. Follow. Fear of losing out <laughs> as a common mistake that we make when it comes to investing. And another one is uh, 
is a diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I think that is very important. And even Elizabeth highlighted some key investment options. And I'd want us to look at, go back to these investment options and first have a focus on investing in capital markets. Uh, we have some uh, questions around how can one invest in shares? What, is, what are the requirements to invest in shares? Elizabeth, you can tell us more. You can give us more information and how much, what is like the minimum amount required to invest in shares? Elizabeth? All right. So investing in shares is very simple. You can invest by yourself or you can use a professional um, advisor to get into the market. Let's say you've got money, you want to go to the stock market. The first thing you need is to have a CDS, uh, CDSC account. So you'll go to your stock broker and open an account and deposit money. And uh, if you have got the information, you, you, you'll make a choice of which stock you want to buy. And with the monies, the broker will buy you the shares. The minimum number of shares, the exchange has rules, the minimum number of shares you can buy in, an ex in a Nairobi Securities Exchange is 100 shares. So if you're going to buy a share which is priced at 100 shillings, then you can calculate the minimum amount you must have with your broker. So depending on the share price, then the minimum amount will also vary. So that's how you buy and trade shares. Your brokers, uh, stock brokers, help you to trade in the stock market. I think NCBA is a stock broker. You can be able to reach out to them and get more information from them. If you choose to go to your fund manager, you can buy into uh, pool funds or collective investment schemes that are dedicated to invest in the stock exchange. You can buy equity funds. These are funds that invest primarily in the stock exchange and therefore they give you the same exposure but with more benefits that come loaded with the fact that a fund manager is going to be trading on your behalf, is going to be tracking the stocks and reporting to you. So that's another uh, opportunity and the collective investment schemes have different minimum amounts that you can invest in. They range as low as 250 shillings, I think, in Kenya. Uh, but obviously, when you're investing, you need to be to continuously add into your uh, into your port. So you invest, so you you grow your port of investments. But those are the two main ways that you can invest in the capital markets in our country. Diana. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I don't know if you've touched on minimum amount required. Yes, like I've said, I, how, uh -huh. I have said if you are going directly to the exchange, depending on the share that you're going to you're going to buy, the minimum number of shares is what the exchange dictates, that you can buy a minimum of 100 shares. So if, for example, you want to buy Safaricom, and Safaricom is trading at uh, 30 shillings, that means that uh, you need 3,000 shillings. If you are going to buy BAT, which is trading at, uh, say, 400 shillings, you multiply times 100. So you find that you need 40,000. So there is no minimum amount that the exchange puts. Instead, they say the minimum number of shares you should buy at a trade size. Then when you go to the, to the collective investment schemes, basically, Every collective investment scheme has rules and conditions that you must satisfy. They have put minimum investments and they vary. They are not regulated. It's for every scheme, there's a different amount. For example, if you come to ICA Lion, the minimum investment you require to buy into equities is 5,000 shillings. And you can add into that anytime, whenever you want. Okay, That's thank you for that. Yeah, that's better. Thank you very much, F. Elizabeth. No, there's some, I can see someone has a genuine concern. Instead of no fear of losing out, there's the fear of investing, mainly because they have been exposed. Elizabeth, you mentioned collective investment schemes. They invested in a money market, so they want more clarification on how secure money market funds are, specifically commercial paper and corporate bonds. If there's someone you called maybe a you could assist with that question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, people have had the feelings, and yes, it is true, investment is not for the faint-hearted. Um, but I think it all comes down to the basics. Um, Warren Buffett said, never invest in something that you cannot understand. And if you cannot hold it for 10 minutes, 
don't for 10 years don't hold it for 10 minutes um the idea here is to say that if i'm investing or i'm putting my money in something i need to understand what i'm investing in i need to know um, and, and not just follow the heart because Diana invested or because Elizabeth invested and I now see them driving nice big cars and I decide that now I am going to be to do what they did so that I can be like them. Um, and that involves doing things like the risk profile that Diana in, in, in mentioned earlier. Because what happens with a lot of people, especially when you follow the heart, is that you invest in something that is not is not compatible to your, you, for example, your investment horizon. When you're doing a risk profile, we look at investment horizon. How long do you intend to, to hold this investment? What kind of risk are you willing to take on this investment or are you even able to take on this investment? And based on that, we advise you and tell you um, this is what is right for you. Now, we go and invest in things we don't understand, in things which are not compatible for us, but this all comes out of one very simple thing, ignorance. Now, it is important to go and sit with your investment advisor. And I heard Elizabeth saying this severely. Go and sit with your investment advisor. Start with doing a risk profile. Once you do your risk profile, the, your investment advisor is able to tell you, based on your risk profile, my friend, the way you are, you don't want to buy things like shares, or you don't want to be going, if you're dealing with the, with the wealth management, you don't want to be going into something like um, a, a, an equity fund because there's a level of risk. But for every type of investor, there is a type of investor that suits them. You'll find that speculatively, business people are natural investors in equities which are more risky. But as office types, tend to be very risk averse. And so when we invest in something and we lose money, we become very jittery. And so we are better off sometimes, and it's not necessary to all of us, but based on our understanding of the investments, we will be able to guide you in the type of investments that you need to. And when you go into an investment based on such um, an informed position, it means that if you buy a quality stock today, I always tell people investment is like marriage. If you get the right person and you get the right investment, then you know even when small bumps go, you go back to the basics. Why did I invest in this in the first place? Why did I get married in the first place to this person? What is it I love about them? It means you're willing to stay with that person or with that investment for 10, 15, 20 years because you know that this is a stable, they're doing the business right, they're above board, they have very good business um, strategies and all those things which make you comfortable when you're investing in them. And even when something goes wrong, it is harder for you to feel cheated or to even worry too much about a loss. Right now in the COVID-19 time, people are very worried because the investments have gone, have gone 50% down. They're calling us, we're telling them to buy more. And they think, hey, are you crazy? Why would I buy something when I put a, a hundred, a thousand shillings in and now it's 500 and you're telling me to put another thousand to average down because the underlying objectives of that investment are good. And so we expect that going forward, it will be good. Sometimes we invest in toxic, what we call value traps, toxic stocks. The company is technically insolvent. The company is not going to survive. So the share price keeps going down and you come to us and they're like, my friend, take this loss, let's look for something else. Again, we become attached. So these are the sort of things that we need to look at. Diana, may I add something? Okay. And I think I'll add because of the question around loss on money market funds. Technically speaking, money market funds are supposed to be low risk investment type of uh, vehicles. However, in our country, it is very important that you dig you, you dig into what the manager or the, the, the manager behind the money market fund has invested into. And you are entitled to information. You are entitled to see the portfolio, how it is structured. Because like I told you, behind that portfolio, it, behind that money market fund, other than just the sweet name money market fund, there are underlying instruments. So there are those of uh, those managers who've invested, for example, in commercial papers, if you find that a money market fund is 60% uh, commercial papers, then they have accumulated excessive risk and they've accumulated for you. And that is how 
perhaps you found yourself in a situation where a money market fund, despite being described as a money market fund, ended up uh, compromising on your credit and you lost maybe your money or your money is tied up uh, completely and you can't access it. The other thing is we all always start nice. However, over time, things change. Keep monitoring your investments. Just because you did a due diligence when you were going in the first time, for example, you came to ICA Lion in 2010, come and check on us. Find out, are we still the same or are we better or have we been deteriorated? Because companies evolve just like humans evolve. So do regular monitoring and checks and balances of the investments that you hold, including even companies that you may invest in. If KCB was good 20 years ago, is it good today? If Kenya Airways was good 20 years ago, is it good today? Because this company is alive. These are live things that keep on changing and they may change for good or for worse. So do not just sit back and think, it was a money market fund, I'll sit pretty and I'll find my money safe. So those are the other things I can add on top of what uh, Samuel has, has said. Back to Thank you. you. Thank you very much, F.A. Elizabeth, F.A. Samuel. These are very great contributions and I believe our attendees are learning a lot from you. We appreciate. We con we've conducted a poll. Thank you all for taking part in that very brief poll. And it's around our conversation today. So the first question we're asking, do you save? 89 have voted in six minutes and 93% say yes, they save, which indeed is great. Now the next question, do you invest? 88% said yes. 12% no. So you can see between saving and investing, there's a percentage there they save, but they really don't invest. Now, the third question was, what have you invested in? And number one will shock you. <laughs> I'm sure you can guess. Land and property takes it at 28%. <laughs> so somewhere you are right. Shamba and Yoyo, Kenyan guys, being a um, there's that sentimental attachment to land. So there we have it. Uh, land and property is number one at 28%, followed by shares at 21%. We have unit trust at 17%. Um, then uh, T bills, treasury bills and treasury bonds at 8%. Business, some have invested in business at 8%. Cryptocurrencies at 1%. And finally, Forex. 4%. So I'd want us to focus on uh, the ones that of course have low percentages. It seems that people don't really invest in. And I'd want to begin with the one that is currently catching ground. It's like the new kid on the block and it's more, it's a, what the youngins like to relate with when it comes to investing, Forex. And I've seen so many questions coming up around Forex. What are the risks around Forex? What is it? It is an award category. Can people really make money from it? Uh, I'll take, I'll give this to F.A. Samuel. You can add a bit, you can shed a bit more light on Forex. Can discuss more about it. Well, let me start by saying that there is no bad investment. Um, the goal and the objective that brings you into that investment is the key to the decision or to the judgment of whether it was a bad investment or a good investment. Um, before I go into Forex, I'll just clarify one thing, that if you're investing in land, you need to look at what is the return on my investment. I've seen some people do some really interesting things like buy a piece of land and build small hostels and make a lot of money on them because they're small units, they're not very high maintenance and they make a good return on a smaller piece of land. Um, so the question is, what sort of returns are you going to get on that? And uh, are, do, does it suit or the, does it fit apart from the sentimental side of it? Now, come to Forex, which is another instrument of investment. Foreign exchange is investment or Forex investment is really investment in cash. You're buying cash, buying and selling different currencies against each other. Now, um, this for me, and I, I, be, I, I believe um, most of those who are in financial advisory know that it is a zero-sum game. One thing about Forex is you can trade large or huge amounts of money because it's a leveraged kind of trading. Now, leveraged kind of trading means that you only put money in for the margin 
of for the amount, say, if you, for example, you're looking at a margin of 10% and you're trading $100, you only need to put in the $10. And if you lose the whole $10, you can decide to put in 10 more dollars, or you can gain $10 and you have $20. So it can go either way. And it's very similar, say, to derivatives tips trading. When I've asked many, I've had many people after we do trainings on this saying, oh, but this sounds like gambling. Um, probably, yes, you need to have a lot of information to know why a certain currency will move against another currency. Uh, things like, um, you, you know, the balance of payments of this country, countries, the information that is going around, why is the dollar going to go, go against the shilling? Is it demand for the dollar? You know, is it reserves? Whatever issues that will affect the value of the dollar against the shilling, you need to be quite in the know. The interesting thing about Forex, and um, I will confess that I have tried it myself, is they usually give you accounts which are global, you know, you can log in and they'll give you a test account where you can try to trade in Forex for you know, a short time and so that in three months you sort of see whether you understand it or you don't. And when you get in there and you take positions on these Forex uh, different currencies, you notice you have very little in terms of control or knowledge about how they will move unless you follow the news and the announcements that are going on in real time. And in a very short time, you can make a gain and in the next five minutes, you've made a loss, which means it's something that you need to be very keen and very uh, focused on if you are doing it. And that is when you're doing it for yourself. But then again, we have several Forex dealers right now. I think we have uh, some which have even been licensed by CFA. I think one, the first one was done recently. And if you go and look at what they do, you're going to see that these are now the experts doing it. So the question I would have here is, is it you doing it for yourself or is it, are you, are you engaging an expert to do it for you? And secondly, are they regulated? I'm happy that now we have one that is regulated by CMA because then if something goes wrong, do you have a fallback? Um, because if you go to just some guy on the street and he tells you he's doing Forex and you invest in him, if you do lose your money, and this is a zero-sum game, so I know people have lost money, how, what is your fallback? How do you actually go and follow up and say, I was misinformed or I was guaranteed a return and I did not get So just to cover Forex completely, there's still a question on, is that tax related to Forex? Um, well, if it's regulated, I think tax is always related to income. So again, are you disclosing whatever income you Get because some of these are global. So again, you're going on the internet. I think you don't even put the money here. You're sending it to whatever account you send it to them. So I, I, I'm not quite clear on that area, but I believe if it's the local one, there must be a way that the government gains on tax. But remember, even in the stock market, usually if there are taxes related to these kind of things, they're usually taken at the point of the return happening. For example, the tax on dividends uh, you know, the withholding tax on dividends is taken at source. The withholding tax on, on interest on bonds is taken at source, so not directly to you. Okay. Thank you, Samuel. Okay. Thanks for that. So, Elizabeth, you talked about uh, money markets and uh, you highlighted some, uh, the way it should be low risk, but there's someone who's still asking, are there secure money markets and how can, you can also educate uh, our attendees. How can one start investing in money market and what are the requirements? And uh, in addition to that, since they're all related, someone is still asking, can one just invest in capital market and money market as pension instead of putting money in a pension scheme? I think they're all related. Okay. Let's start with money market. How do you invest and how do you select a money market fund? Uh, money market funds are regulated by capital markets authorities. So the, on that aspect, uh, the vehicles that are used for money market funds are safe vehicles. However, when you're selecting your fund manager, it is good to, to understand what uh, sort of fund uh, and the underlying investments that the manager has bought into. So when you're going to scout for a money market fund, 
I ensure that you ask questions about the asset allocation, what, is the, what are the investments that the fund manager has taken so that you have a bit of color of what they have done. If they tell you we have 50% uh, in commercial papers and you're a very risk averse person, then that is not the type of money market fund you should be uh, investing in because you are seeking to preserve your capital. You should be looking at a money market fund which is uh, diversified, but also holding on to securities that are more secure and not risk taking. And the, the rule of the thumb is, and what I tell, tell investors is, uh, if you're looking for a money market fund, even if a fund manager does not tell you that they are taking risk, their return can tell you they are taking risk because uh, high returns come loaded with high risk. So the higher the return, the higher the risk. So you can actually rank us as fund managers according to our risk profile uh, by just looking at the returns that we are able to deliver and you compare with the government securities because alternatively, you could have walked to the central bank and bought a treasury bill, for example. So if a treasury bill is paying you 7% and a money market is paying you 10 or 12%, then the differential is the risk that the manager has taken. So that's how you measure. If a manager is below the treasury, it tells you what is it they are not doing? Where is their skill? So again, you also need to ask the ones who are too low, the ones who are too high, the ones who are moderate. That's how, in a layman way, you're able to gauge the risk that you're entering into. How do you buy? You sign up uh, to a money market fund uh, by signing the application forms that different managers have. Some have online platforms. Uh, we have financial advisors, for example. I think all the money managers have financial advisors who can help you uh, sign up for money market. With an ID, a PIN number, and a bank account, you're good to go. Only three things. And you sign that form and you're good to go and you start investing. You can uh, invest uh, the minimum amount and top up and also withdraw whenever you want. They are really, really good investments uh, for you. So then the other thing that I would want to mention about investing in the stocks and investing in the, um, uh, in, for pension. When you're investing for pension, these are long term. And there are benefits when somebody invests for, uh, for, for your pension and you shouldn't leave that benefit away. Pension savings are granted tax, uh, uh, tax exemptions by government as long as you invest uh, for, uh, with an intention that it is a pension savings product, you get up to 240,000 tax exempt every year. But if you come to money market fund, you will pay some taxes. So you'll be leaving money on the table if you put all your investments in uh, collective investment schemes and not use a vehicle that is dedicated as a pension scheme. For individuals, the dedicated vehicles for pension schemes are called individual pension plans and they are available. They are there in the market. Different uh, insurance companies, fund managers, we've got those solutions. So you should be able to identify a good quality pension plan that you can invest in and therefore reduce your tax uh, burden. So the first thing I would tell you, the first lot of 20,000, take it to a pension plan, which will give you a tax benefit. The excess, you can maybe consider now moving to other uh, to other things, but there are benefits of investing in a pension plan and not in a collective investments uh, plan. That's what I would answer for now. Thanks, Elizabeth. You've heard it. Uh, pension is equally very important, and it's uh, there are tax benefits that are tied to it. So still, don't reject or neglect pension. So over to a question, Shamba. I'll give it to Samuel. Someone is asking, given the current COVID pandemic health risk, the risk of owning real estate is very high in terms of unpaid rents by tenants. Could you enlighten those who have invested in this investment and more, and more so what is the future in this? Could we be seeing reduction in rents charge and therefore low future investments in this area? Well, um, I think uh, rent is directly linked, or let, let me start with the land itself. Um, land is a long-term asset, and uh, land, I know that a lot of the time when we're investing in land, we have had people telling me, you know, land never loses in value. And uh, that, for me, is where we sometimes go wrong. I'll ask you, for example, 20... 
25 years ago, most people wanted to live in estates like Puruburu because that was a really high area. Um, and everybody wanted an office in CBD. Now, over time, what has happened? The estates have moved towards, I think now it's, uh, is it Kilimani or Upper Hill, right? So what happens is land does grow in value, but sometimes you'll notice that that value shifts to a different place. And for that reason, um, if you look at CBD now, we have what we call the donut effect. Uh, CBD has become a university because nobody wants an office in CBD. So rents in CBD will tend to have stagnated as rents in the peripheries grow. So again, um, is real estate a, a bad investment? It is great as long as you're focusing on the areas where the growth is, probably not going to where it is already ex ex uh, expensive, but looking at where the next wave will probably be. And that's why a lot of the time you see this Broti uh, Maguta Maguta, they move to a new area and that is the new Maguta Maguta area. But um, that said, um, land is not dead and it cannot die because um, a, po a point which is we have more people wanting it's a fixed it's a f land is fixed it doesn't grow we have more people every day so more people need land so and that's why eventually people start building upwards because then you can't make one acre cannot become two acres to always be one acre and as our cities grow and our urban areas grow and our areas of residence then there will be a tendency to see that uh, you can milk a small piece you will try to milk more and more and more out of a smaller piece of land and that means that eventually land is a good investment but in the medium and the short term COVID-19 has happened and land is one of those areas that uh, for example because of rentals is going to have to suffer and uh, what I did uh, I think earlier I was doing something and trying to explain to some people what's going to happen especially in this COVID-19 situation is that we have four quadrants of what is going to happen and I think land will will land in what we call the slow recovery part of it. Uh, slow recovery areas is things like hospitality, tourism, private education, uh, retail trade and beauty products, heavy manufacturing and yes real estate will take time to recover uh, because it, there was a bubble and we can't deny the fact that there was a bubble and then now people have less um, disposable income. So I think right now it would be a good idea you cannot, you see, the, the landlords are sitting in what we call a catch-22 situation. You cannot kick out that guy who's not paying rent because no one else will move in. So again, because of COVID-19, and these guys are probably just uh, suffering because of a slowdown in the economy, after this whole thing goes away and maybe within another few months we start to ease, these guys will be able to pay. And don't forget, these are guys who've always paid you rent. It's just that something wrong has happened. So it's not time to give up. I think this is the time to understand that investments will always have their ups and downs. But I think for now, it would be an, an issue of wait it out, try to trim down and live with what you have right now, the little rent that you're getting and get over this. And then later on, we are going to see how it pans out. But land is not a bad investment. The issue is what are you doing with that land? Just for the information of those who are watching, um, there are we have now a new category of stocks called stay at home stocks or stay at home investments. For example, in the technology and the digital space. So if you're looking at the likes of Safari and whatever is in technology, even if it's in the private equity space, it's a good place to be investing right now. Health supplies, people who are doing that will make money. There were guys making masks and medis, medical supplies, you know, gloves. Um, health products and of course detergent and sanitation those are going to make a very good return uh, of, of very good growth during this period then there are those ones which will decline even after and land does not fall here here we are seeing things like business tourism and probably even second hand clothing then we have those ones that will quickly recover which is food processing tea coffee textiles restaurants uh, pubs uh, food vendors and automotive those will recover quickly because as soon as people are back to work Things like matatus will start making as much as they used to, maybe a little less because they're carrying less passengers, but they will figure it away. Um, so I think it's not, you can't write off land, but try to look for the higher returns and also don't lock your money into the land because then sometimes it's very illiquid. So if you have money and you want it to be liquid, 
I don't think land is the best thing. You'd rather be giving it to say a money market fund or a or a fixed income fund because then you can retrieve it easily or even in stocks it is easier to retrieve because of liquidity. Thanks for that, Samuel. And another way of investing in real estate, uh, which is a more liquid way of investing in real estate, is the real estate investment trusts. But we have seen them in Kenya, but they're still very unpopular. If Elizabeth, maybe you can tell us, where real estate investment trusts are very unpopular in Kenya, is it that the minimum investment entry is beyond the common man? Or is it a case that the property market in Kenya uh, is highly unregulated. What are the reasons that are making real estate investment very really unpopular in Kenya? All right, so REITs in Kenya are fairly new. I think the first REIT came in 2016, true? 2016, that is when we got the first REITs in Kenya. Uh, it was a fairly new concept for Kenyans uh, where we are saying uh, you're investing in a property, uh, but in a, in a unit of a property. And we know that um, in, culturally, Kenyans love tangible assets where they can say, this is mine. So as much as it is being called a real estate investment uh, trust, and it is invested purely in the real estate, a lot of people did not uh, conceptualize the idea that they are not owning the property itself. Instead, they are getting shares that are listed in the stock market. That was one uh, big uh, thing that hindered uh, uptake of uh, of the REIT. So its success was not that great in, despite the fact that they had really popularized, they really done a lot of awareness and creation and things like that. Um, the popularity of a REIT uh, will continue to be a challenge and uh, probably uh, now I speak from the point where as ICA Lion, we are the new owners of the REIT. So we need to do much more in creating awareness, in bringing more people to the uh, to, to, to understand how REITs work. They are good vehicles because they give you diversification. I think that's something that most people don't know, that when you buy a REIT, you buy into properties that are more liquid because you're buying a share of several properties. And on top of that, you can be able to trade those shares. And like land, when you buy your plot or you have your building, uh, illiquidity is the main thing. So REITs come and take away the illiquidity. REITs come to, di uh, to discover price on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So if the investments that are underlying are suitable investments and are good underlying uh, uh, properties, then the REIT valuations will also reflect into that. But that hasn't been uh, the case for Kenya. So we've had a bit of those, 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 those investors who tried the REIT, they've had to lose money. And so it has not created the optimism that was anticipated. So there's that element. Uh, they're not expensive to buy because like I said, when it is a REIT that is listed, the requirements is that the minimum investment you can make is a hand is a, no actually it is higher than the 100 shares for a REIT the minimum investment was actually five million shillings so there's that element of uh, inaccessibility because of the minimum investment but it is because they also understand the exchange understands you're getting into a unique investment this is not your ordinary stock so you need to understand it better so if you are going to buy into a REIT I would advise you visit a manager have a better understanding what what, what you're, you're getting into. And going forward, I anticipate that we'll be seeing more REITs coming, especially as we recover from COVID. I think it will be easier to commingle all these properties that are struggling and sell them as vehicles to many more investors and diversify the profile of the clients and the profile of the portfolio. So it's, it's an opportunity that is also awaiting to be discovered and to be offered to clients. Thank I'd you very much. To, I'd like to weigh in on this one a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, you see, there are two types of REITs. There's a development REIT, which you invest in the development, and then when they sell the properties, you make your money. And then there is the investment REIT, where you there is a property owned by somebody, and they allow you to buy into that property. Um, I've always said that in Kenya, if you look at our real estate space, we have this kind of thing, but informally, which means they are not listed. And we have seen what has happened. We have all these gated communities uh, that are failing left, right, and center. And they are very similar. Only the fact that they are not listed. They are very similar to what the de development rate or the investment rate is trying to do. 
which is getting several investors to pull their money into a basket can go and say develop buy a plot or a piece of land in longer lot and build houses in longer lot and then everybody has a share in those houses the only problem as elizabeth has said comes at the point of liquidity because then they are not traded on an open market they're not being traded in smaller units because then if you look at the the rate that is listed on the Nairobi Securities Exchange, you can actually buy in small, 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 you know, 100 shares of the rate, actually. You can do 2,000 shares if you like. So again, this listed entity creates liquidity. It creates ability to enter and exit on a market which is open and makes it much easier. So I think some of these things, and I do agree with Elizabeth when you're saying that all these ones, uh, these, um, you know, different ones that we're seeing trading out there, um, probably due to management issues or whatever is causing it to happen. Um, of course, there's, we've seen some of them is just pure dishonesty of the people who are running them. Um, if this can be brought together and channeled into a big, you know, something that is well organized and listed on a market, then it would give that Joroge and Wanjiko on the street uh, to be able to access the market. Because then they can come and say, yeah, I want to buy a few shares in that big, the same way you're buying into a big company, you can buy into a big estate that's happening in Mutaiga and walk around feeling that you have a partnership in that. And I believe all Kenyans want a piece of this land thing, and that would be a great way to mobilize public funds. Thanks for that, Elizabeth Samuel. We've talked about uh, real estate, we've talked about uh, shares, we've talked about some alternative investments like Forex, and now we need um, and, uh, and a bit of collective investment schemes like the unit trusts and the money market fund. Now we want to talk a bit more on uh, fixed income. And uh, Elizabeth, maybe you can tell us, with the declining yield curves as projected, would it be safe to invest in fixed deposit securities at the moment? And still on the same point as you're talking about fixed deposits, you can also enlighten us about investing in government securities, what are the requirements, what is the minimum amount? If Elizabeth? Uh, all right. So the, somebody has said the yield curve is uh, declining, and uh, they're technically right. It's declining uh, on the short end, but the long end has, has also done a bit of lifting a little bit. So. Uh, a bit of uh, different scenarios happening at different parts of that yield curve. Um, would it be good for one to invest in uh, government securities or in the fixed income space at this at, at this particular time? Uh, yes, but it also depends now with your profile. So again, it speaks to you. What is the objective of your investing? It's still a good investment uh, place to go to. Uh, government securities, like you said, they have the lowest uh, default risk. The, the likelihood of a default, and we can argue about this so, and, and split hairs, but the likelihood of default is the lowest compared to corporate uh, corporate bonds. So it's, I'd still say it is a good investment uh, space, but first of all, understand yourself how long you want to invest uh, for what tenure and all that. Now, buying and selling of government securities, again, these are listed securities in the stock exchange. The government issues every, uh, bonds every month, new bonds every month, and there are others which are listed in the exchange. You can be able to buy directly, or you can be able to go through vehicles that are created through some of the professional uh, fund managers and, and investment advisors that are in the country. So if you want to go directly, you'd have to go to the central bank, open a CDS, uh, CDS account with the central bank. It is accessible. Central bank is not, uh, does not limit you from going there. You can be able to walk to central bank between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. and ask them, how do I open an account? And they'll give you a form. They're still very much manual. You fill in the forms, provide your bank details, ask your banker to confirm that that is your bank and your tax and PIN certificates. And uh, once they set you up, you can be able to buy your bonds uh, uh, whenever the, there is an auction. But obviously, it's a technical thing to be going into an auction if you don't understand how bonds actually auction or how pricing is done. So that is why I say I always seek the services of a professional fund manager 
to help you in making such decisions of buying and selling such securities. If you come to us as, uh, through, our, through the collective investment schemes, there are schemes that are tailored and only invest in government securities. You can be able to invest in those pool funds and it's as simple as filling an application form and putting in the minimum investment and continuously you can buy and sell whatever uh, amount you have. And uh, they offer more liquidity because if you buy a 20 year bond, you may struggle to sell a 50,000 because the minimum amount you can invest in a bond in Kenya is 50,000. Uh, but when it comes to selling it, uh, it may be quite a difficult thing to go to the stock exchange and tell the broker, I want to sell this 50,000 to someone else. Then finally, there is something that government introduced that was called Akiba, Emakiba. What is what is it called, Emakiba, that one, the, the mobile one. You can be able to buy the mobile bond. Sometimes government opens up uh, that route through a USSD, you're able to, uh, to register and buy your government bond uh, through your mobile. It is an innovation that government started. It's only in Kenya. It is, um, it's, 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 it wasn't a biggest success, but definitely there are people who are earning their 10% by investing in three year tax exempt uh, uh, bond uh, by the government of Kenya. So that's another avenue that you can be able to use. When they reopen, they always create a lot of awareness and buzz around it. So you'd be able to know when it's coming. And again, your financial advisor should be able to tell you when such opportunities are opening up. Thank okay, you. On, this, on the same point, Elizabeth, you mentioned financial advice, I can advise you. There's someone yes. who's asking, are there charges, financial advisory, and now uh, that is also an extra cost, so financial <laughs> advisory. So does that mean one cannot invest by themselves? No, I said you can go to the market directly and buy, go to the central bank and buy. However, if you don't even know how it trades, I wonder how you're going to buy. That is the challenge of going directly when you don't know. But uh, it's not that difficult. It is not the most difficult thing. There are, I think there are client relationship persons at Central Bank who may help you to fill in the forms, but you will be buying without understanding fully what you're getting into. Well, I am, uh, but, let me just read in. Uh, for brokers, yes. you can actually go to your broker. We do have bond desks at the brokerages. Uh, so for those of all you who are looking to invest in bonds, um, the reason um, Emma Kiba was done is because then you want to rope in the people with the small amounts, let's say 3,000, 5,000, but it can also go up to even more than that, 50,000. But when you're trying to buy from CBK, um, of course, after you open the account, if you have an account with a broker, um, for example, with us in CB Investment Bank, we all actually offer that service. You can actually uh, buy the bond through us. Um, of course, there's a small brokerage charge, I believe. Um, was you can zero five percent, and um, we are able to give you some advice just on what, what you know what bonds are they in the money and you know the different uh, aspects to consider. Uh, we also try to seek uh, buyers for you if you're trying to sell. But as Elizabeth said, bonds, especially small, the smaller lots can be very a bit difficult to sell. But the beauty about bonds is that is that they have the buyer of last resort. If you really, really want to get rid of that bond, the central bank will actually buy it off you, albeit at probably a discounted price. Thank you, F. Elizabeth, F. Samuel. Maybe F. Samuel is still on you. Can one borrow to invest? Do you think it's a good idea or must one just save and then you invest? So is there another option borrowing? Uh, one of the reasons for the market crash in 1927 before the Great Depression was exactly that, borrowing to invest in shares. Shares are risky assets. Um, if you're going to borrow to invest, then you better have um, uh, something else that will help you to, because you see, if it's a loan you're paying, you have to pay the loan. And you see, if you're, if you're borrowing to buy the shares, the shares you bought will be frozen. So you cannot sell those shares until you get a loan. So again, um, it means that you borrow, you buy the shares, but you have to pay the loan before you can actually, because those shares are usually used as a collateral. So there are banks who will give you loans, but normally on shares you have already bought, and they'll give you probably something like 50% of the amount. We did see during the Safaricom IPO, there were banks that gave people 
loans to buy the safari com shares but when you bought i think when you bought those shares those shares will be frozen because it's the same as when you buy a car and you borrow money to buy the car the logbook is under the name of yourself and the bank you can only now sell that car and first pay whatever is left of the loan and whatever the residue is probably take it which would be an agreement with whoever lent you that uh, money to buy the stocks but then if you borrow to buy the stocks and you don't have an income that is suffice or is enough to pay for that stock and i doubt the dividends you get will help you to play, pay for that loan then i think it's a recipe for disaster loan. Thanks, Samuel, and uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll need to adjust your volume a bit. There's some attendees who are claiming the volume is a bit low, but just kindly try to adjust it. And now well, we want to focus on our cryptocurrencies. You can see some questions coming in. Please note that we're on the plenary discussion. We're just answering questions as we go along. We're mostly uh, answering the questions from our attendees. So. Samuel, is trading in cryptocurrency regulated in Kenya? Is it legal? It is not regulated. Uh, the central bank has uh, severally said that uh, you should do it at your own risk. Um, and so I, I even believe that there are certain, uh, there are certain things that, uh, you know, um, in cryptocurrencies, because they are not really, they are actually created not to be regulatable. Really. So again, we, there's that debate between central banks and uh, the cryptocurrencies has not been answered. So yes, it is at your own risk. Really. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So we're getting a lot of questions still on money markets, Elizabeth. Someone is asking, is it a good time to invest in money market funds. There seems to be a lot of interest in that. All right. Money market funds are technically created to give you better returns than your current account deposit because money market fund comes with benefits of accessing your money when you want, uh, preserving your capital, and topping up and being able to uh, topping up anytime you want and you can be able to remove the money you want and you earn your interest on a daily basis so that's the beauty of money market so if you've got idle money you're packing your money in your bank the best place to put the money is actually money market fund because it starts working for you as you expend it so it's always good to first of all pack your money before you find a permanent home where you would want to invest those funds into. So let's say, for example, you've got a bonus. Instead of leaving it in your current account, where banks will use it for, uh, will, will get cheap deposits, you can actually put it in money market. And for the period that you're still making a decision which car to buy or upgrade the house, then you're earning something out of it. And then finally, you get into your project and you expend it. So they are good for your emergency funds, it's good for elderly people who have been paid maybe your, their pension and they want to keep some money where they can be accessing it uh, because of the safety that comes with it. So it's a, it's a, it's a fund that is always suitable. But again, uh, I wouldn't say that you go to a money market fund as a retirement plan. No, it isn't. It is, uh, it is good for parking. I say money which is on transit. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. And still to you on this on a, on a different matter. There's someone who needs to know, and maybe this one you need to be a bit careful how you answer it. What will be the most ideal portfolio makeup in the Kenyan market today, assuming moderate risk appetites? <laughs> <laughs> that is a catch question. I am a business development person, so anyway. But just to try and answer that question around uh, what is the ideal portfolio, I say diversification is everything. Uh, start by first of all creating your, um, your, your emergency fund using your cash and cash equivalent, either your money market fund or your fixed deposit or your treasury bill. 
uh, then now you have another pot that is dealing with your medium term goals, uh, bonds would fall into that. And for that matter, I would strictly uh, put you into government securities, which are not too long term. Uh, maybe you're able to buy a government bond, which is five years, that would really be your medium term, five, 10 years would be your medium term. And then for your capital growth, uh, because the medium term will give you both uh, capital, uh, would give you cash flow uh, from the government bonds. For your capital growth, I would say buy fundamentally strong cap, uh, uh, stocks from the exchange. And here you must use fundamentals to choose the stock you're buying. Don't just buy because it looks one shilling. Don't run away from a stock because it looks 400 shillings and you say that one is expensive. It could be the cheapest stock because we don't look at stocks using price, we use valuation. So your, mid, your short term, use money market, medium term, go to government securities, uh, long term goals, go to your, uh, to, your, to, to your equities. And if you really have a lot more money on your long term, you can load their uh, property. That's um, not yeah. Just to delve in a little bit on that one, um, I think the, the key is also in your risk profile. And as you said, I'm, like, I'm happy that the question actually said, you know, they had a time limit for what is the term, is it long term, is it medium term? And they also, like in the process, mentioned um, you know, the sort of risk level that they were, they were dealing with. Um, now, if, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at it from a perspective of the risk profile, what we do is once we do the risk profile, assuming you come out as a moderate investor, that moderate investor spectrum is where we now say a certain percentage, say 10%, should be in a more risk asset like money market fund. Another uh, aspect, uh, for example, Um, another aspect of the whole thing is going to be to be covering, for example, the fixed income, and that is exactly what Elizabeth was saying. So, say another twenty percent. Then another twenty percent, even within the stock market, we have different types of shares. We have those ones which are called defensive, which are the ones Elizabeth is saying you should look for those stocks which are stable and they are bigger market share, they are more, you know, predictable. And then we have those ones we call growth. They can grow more. They are more. There's more. You know volatility there and then we have the speculative ones so how much will go into the high risk and depending on where you are on the spectrum if you are 70 and over we will be defensive and more fixed income because you cannot lose afford to lose your principal if you are say a young guy you would do more on the speculative side because you have time to recover and you want you know quick in, in and out in a shorter period of time so then that is something that we discuss individually based on your risk profile and then we sort of put it in the right places and live with that. But your risk profile changes. I think today I was advising investors, if you have done a risk profile and you are very speculative and high risk, right now during COVID-19, you need to reduce because chances are you will be risk averse. You need to be you know, where you're safer. So it means you can change your risk profile and restructure your portfolio in a period like this so that you survive. And that goes for the guy who asked about real estate earlier and rent. That this is a time where you look at your investments and decide, should I move more weight to the less risky for now until things change and then I can go back into the risk. Yeah, thank you, F.S. Samuel. Now, very briefly, still on you. We've seen just recently people are losing money, especially some schemes, some fraudulent investments, whether it's um, you know what I'm talking about, but what advice can you give uh, as a financial analyst and based on your expertise to Kenyans on how to just stay away from fraudulent investments? One, if it sounds too good, think twice. I mean, if you're coming and telling me you're giving me like 50% return in, I don't know, a month or two months or whatever, something is wrong. I mean, if I knew something like that, why would I be telling you in the first place? I would be making it for myself. Um, so if it sounds too good, then you need to think twice. Uh, the second one, and I like what Elizabeth said earlier, is talk to your financial advisor. And in as much as we deal in stocks and in, uh, in, 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 
in different areas that we deal with, money market funds and all that, we are financial advisors. And one of the things you realize, even in what I do, is there's a lot of people who will come here. Some of them, um, you'd be surprised, are old workers from the village, and they'll come and say, okay, I sold a plot and I have this money. And I have these children going to school at a certain time, and I was thinking of shares. We are able to look at that and tell you, you know, where he, this one, you cannot put it here. Or this one, that investment, you need to know ABC. Look at, get your lawyer, we don't like paying for services. Get your lawyer and give him that agreement. And tell him, read this and tell me where the problem is. You're better off spending that few thousand shillings to have your lawyer advise you on that thing than losing the whole one million because you thought you don't want people to know because you're going to make a killing and then you'll show it to them later. So get advice. Talk. We don't ask for advice. We don't want to pay for advice. We go and move into things just because they look very sweet. One thing I noticed with one of the recent ones that failed, I remember you told you are supposed to pay, say, 1.5 million now. And then within a year, you pay another 3.5 million. Now, a lot of people don't seem to go and look at their earnings and the spectrum of their earnings and the kind of earnings they have. And don't forget, within the contract, it says that if you don't pay on time, you're going to lose, I think, 60 or 70% of what you've already paid. Now, two, three months down the line is when you realize that that business deal you were expecting to cut to pay the other 3 billion is not coming through. You don't have anywhere to borrow the money or the loans that you thought you could borrow are not coming through. COVID-19 has happened, it has slowed down. So now you're behind on your payments and somebody is telling you, I can only pay you 30 or 20% of what you put in in the first place. You clearly did not read and did not try to look at your own financial cap capability, how much money you really have or are you able to sustain it. So again, that euphoric investing is very dangerous. Thanks, Samuel. If Elizabeth, I'll need you to combine a few, a couple of questions because of time. But there's someone who wants more insights on derivatives, and uh, we haven't talked much about derivatives. And there's a question here that is up in your alley about uh, which is better, individual pensions plans or provident funds for pensions. Maybe you can explain the difference with regard to pension schemes. All right, derivatives. Now, derivatives, like the name suggests, are securities or investments that derive their value from another security. So they are not by themselves independent, but they rely on the movement of another security. So, for example, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find derivatives that are trading, for example, on, um, what can I say? For example, equities, you have equity derivatives, future contracts. They rely on, the, uh, on another commodity to get another, a, a price. So they are not your direct traditional asset class. So it's very important. Derivatives are used for hedging. So for example, if you talk about commodity futures, which are derivative type of uh, investments, uh, what you'll find is that we are entering an agreement for the future. So like we agree, I will buy your rice or I'll buy your maize at a certain price once you produce it. So the farmer is not, is selling what they have not yet produced. So that's a derivative. It's a futures contract. So the farmer must deliver, must produce the quality of the maize that they have promised. And the person who has promised to buy must buy at the price that they have uh, promised to buy. So you find that those contracts now then go to the market and they trade because maybe I have a view that by the time maize is produced next year, the price will be better or be lower so we can be able to trade. It's a, it's a more complex uh, issue than, uh, than you can see, but they are used mainly for hedging purposes. Let me go to pension because I know derivatives, we can dwell on it for a very long time. It's a whole CFA book on derivatives alone. But let's go to let's go to to your pensions, IPPs, individual pension plans, and provident funds. An individual pension plan basically is a pension plan that admits individuals, different individuals. It's like a collective investment scheme, but this one is purposefully made for saving for your retirement, and it's regulated by the Retirement Benefits Authority, not CMA. So this vehicle 
you come in and you save whatever amount. If your employer does not have a savings plan or even if you want to create a, a retirement package for yourself, you can sign up into an individual pension plan and be investing regularly in it. And you'll enjoy the benefits that come, the tax benefits that RPA gives uh, because the, uh, the, uh, the Retirement Act gives us those benefits. So that's an individual pension plan. When you talk about a provident fund, I th you're talking about the type of payout that a pension plan has, including an individual pension plan. Because an individual pension plan brings in together individuals. You would expect that also companies have Plan, pension plans, but they are called occupational plans because they are for employers and in, in them, their own employees get to invest or get to contribute towards their, their pensions. So for individuals, it's an individual person who contributes. There is no employer, uh, but for the occupational scheme, you have an employer contribution and you have your employee contribution. When you go to Provident, it is just the type of payout you will get once you reach the retirement age. A Provident pension uh, scheme will pay you one lump sum when you attain the retirement age. Let's say your retirement age is 60. They will take everything that you have contributed, whether it is from an IPP or from an occupational scheme, and give you and tell you, enjoy yourself. Go now plan your future. You have 40 million to yourself. It, it is a very interesting concept because it excites some people, some marry again, others do other things. So you get bulk amount of money at a go at the point of retirement. On the other hand, a pension plan will give you an option to be getting monthly payments from your, uh, uh, from your, save, from your pension savings for the, le the rest of your life. So that means you will not get everything that you saved at a go, you'll be getting in a, regular, in a regular manner and therefore you can be able to use that money for a longer period than the person who got a provident fund. But there's much more to pensions it is a wider uh, discussion that we can have, but that's the best I can bring to the table right now. Thank you, Efe. Elizabeth. I'll also request Efe Samuel to combine answering these questions. And I need you also to be careful how you answer in case there is a rally tomorrow at NSC. Is, is it the right time to buy stocks? And um, someone is asking why the corporate bond, the Kenyan, the Kenyan corporate bond sector, why is it not growing? Unfortunately, on mute. I am not, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, um, yes, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was saying that yes, um, in terms of is it the right time to buy stocks? Yes, John Templeton said the term of maximum pessimism is the time to be, to be, you know, to be aggressive and the time of maximum optimism is the time to be, be, be careful. And I think Warren Buffett also said, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Um, there's that aspect of contrarian, aspect of contrarian investing, which means you go against what 90%. Remember the heart, Elizabeth talked about it. Everyone is going in that direction, running away from the rain. You're the one running, you know, towards the umbrella to send to the guys running away from the rain. And so, if you look at how markets work, you will find that that's 1% of very wealthy people tend to buy when everybody does not want to buy into stocks. I will give you a perfect example from my personal experience. Um, if you look at the graphs of what happens to the NSC index, the Nairobi Securities Index, and also the stake stock in the Nairobi Securities Exchange, the year, every year to an election, 203, 207, uh, the next one was 20, 2013 or something like that. Every election year, you will find during the year of the election, stocks rally by over 30%. And during that, uh, the run up to the election is the time where all the campaigns and all those issues, and everybody is saying, let us wait to see what happens if you have the election violence and all that stuff for us to invest. Now, why do they rally when nobody wants stocks? When nobody seems to be interested in stocks, 
their rally. Why? Because the wealthy investor is seeing that everybody is waiting to buy stocks after the election. Because if the election goes well and everything is okay, that's when everybody will trip back to the market. They buy earlier. Right now, everybody is thinking, okay, stocks have fallen by 20-30%, um, will they fall lower? There's a point in the stock market where you look at it and you can see that they're not going any lower. That's the best time to buy. If the news are saying billionaires lose billions in the stock market, why is it that billionaires continue to buy at that time? When the market is saying the stock market has made billions of shillings, that's exactly when everybody in Kenya is interested in stocks, which means you're following the hard. We are going to buy, we usually say in the market, buy, buy the rumor, sell the news. So when you're buying the rumor, you're buying into what is possible tomorrow. When you're selling the news, you're selling because right now the news is telling me that stocks are overvalued. If everybody is saying that billions have been made in the stock market, it means it's high. Sell it, put your money in bonds and wait. When it comes down because of COVID-19 or something else, you buy again, you've made a huge kill. Because then you're coming in, you're buying low and selling high. Um, the other question you asked was on, on what? It was on corporate bonds. Ah, yes, um, yeah, it's a fortunate fact that uh, in Kenya, corporate bonds are, are not secured. Uh, we, I don't think we have any corporate bond that is secured, which means that uh, when such a thing, uh, these corporate bonds fail, it is all dependent on the reputation and the stability of that company. And so um, when you're buying a corporate bond, please make sure you go deeper into what that company is, what is their stability, what is how how confident can you be that they will pay back i mean we've seen some very very good bonds in this market um i mean an example would of course be the ones that have been issued by ncba i think we've seen kenjen which they have managed very well but we've seen those ones that uh, investors are still trying to get back the investments but basically if you look at the underlying company there was a problem at some point Kindly bear with us. This is a very interesting topic. You'll allow us to just add five more minutes. I know we've beat the, the end time for the webinar. Thank you all for keeping still keeping it locked in this webinar. And just for Elizabeth, I feel these are important questions that can be addressed very briefly. Educating on annuities and also what's your take on insurance investment products? All right, annuities. So for annuities, annuities are issued by insurance companies and an annuity basically is a, um, is, a, is a product that is structured such that you get regular uh, payments from your insurance company for a specified period of time. A lot of times, most people who deal with annuities, they buy them when they are at retirement, but they are available even for those who are not retired. So for example, you can pay for a lump sum amount today and you enter into a contract with an insurance company that they will pay you a regular income every month for the rest of your life. They have different terms and conditions. I will introduce two terms and conditions that come into play a lot of times. When you are buying an annuity, you give out a lump sum at the beginning, that's the most common, and then the insurance company promises you regular income for a period of time. So two things can, uh, you, or terms that you'll always hear an insurance company talking to you about is a guaranteed period. A guaranteed period in an annuity contract means that it's a period when, uh, during which, the, whether you're alive or de demised, I wanted to say dead, demise they will pay wh whoever is the beneficiary whether it is you or your uh, beneficiaries who may be remaining during that uh, guaranteed period and the moment the guaranteed period ends then they stop paying and that annuity lapses if your annuity does not have a guaranteed period and you take it today and god forbid after one month you're hit by a lorry it means that your family gets nothing because you did not have a guaranteed period uh, for your annuity uh, program or contract. The other thing that the insurance company will always talk to you about an annuity is about escalation. This means inflation adjustment. Uh, if you buy an annuity with an adjustment, an annual adjustment, it means that every year they will be adjusting the amount they pay you 
by the an inflation by an inflation rate to protect you from the inflation uh, because we know that 100 shillings last year is not the same as 100 shillings today because inflation eats into the value of your money. So a very important aspect that one should always consider when buying an annuity that you have an inflation adjustment every year to allow that you receive money that has been adjusted upwards to accommodate the price increases that are happening in the market. There's much more to an annuity. What I would advise anybody buying into an insurance product, read the detail. The devil is always in the detail and ask as many questions as possible. Then the other question that uh, Dana, you have asked was about what? Insurance investment products. Oh yes, insurance investment products. These are called uh, unit linked products. They are in their investment in nature you choose them with the investment profile that you fit in, whether you're short term, medium term, aggressive and things like that. However, they come with, uh, 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 without, with an insurance tag with them. So even as you buy this uh, product, which is being called an investment product, they do have an insurance component tagged to them. So they have insurance in terms of maybe uh, last respect or a uh, life policy that will be payable if in the event that you uh, you you are to pass pa pass on and things like that. So the only difference is that they've got an insurance component in it, and in computing their value, the value of the insurance, uh, the life policy that is tagged, particular life policy that is tagged is always a consideration. So you can't just walk away from these investment products like the way you normally walk away uh, when you have invested in a collective investment scheme. They've got other conditionalities. Again, you need to understand those conditionalities. But in terms of return, they give you exposure to returns just like the ordinary collective investment schemes will give you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Now, parting short for, to F.A. Samuel. They still are seven percent, twelve percent who say no, they don't save, no, they don't invest. Maybe there are, these are people who live on a daily income. How can you, based on your advice, how can such a person save and invest? Someone who lives on a daily income. What's your advice? Someone you're mute. Sorry, on mute. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Samuel. Yes? No, we still can't hear you. No, unfortunately, we can't hear you. We've lost you, Samuel. No, it's still not working. I don't know what has happened. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Just briefly, you're cutting short. Okay, sorry. Uh, yes, investment, investment should be a habit and it should be something that you can cultivate over time. And that, by this I mean that the biggest issue we have is we're always looking for, to have enough money to invest. I think what we need to do is to try and figure out, look at your lifestyle, for example. And uh, this is something that I have also tried in my own life, and I'm just going to give you as a real life ex experience. Um, sometimes we wake up in the morning and we get dressed and ready for work, and we put on our car and drive all the way to Nairobi. And then we pack our car uh, and pay uh, Kanjo uh, 300 shillings to pack the car. Um, so that car, your one point whatever million, is sitting in the sun all day. Of course, there's a risk someone will take a side mirror during the day. And then in the evening, you take that car and take it home. Of course, we feel that this is our comfort, and I'm not saying that it is wrong to do that. Um, but the question sometimes you need to ask yourself, if you live in a place where there is good transport, public transport, and you take, say, the Matatu to work, and when you come to work in the Matatu, 
what happens of course you need to think a little big because then you feel a little uh, belittled when you see that uh, somebody else is driving and you're in a matatu but it's a good idea to think that this is your limousine you're giving everyone a lift and they're helping you to pay for the fuel but that said if you look at the difference in the cost of the two you're going to realize that on a daily basis and it's good to quantify some of these things if you take a matatu you'll probably be spending 200 shillings a day to and from work Yes, you do have a car, but on the weekend, you can use it for whatever you want to do. If you drive the car to and from work, you're spending about 1,000 shillings plus every day. Don't forget there is wear and tear. You'll eventually service that, that, that car. The other thing is you will tend to walk more because you're walking between stages and whatever you're doing uh, when you're moving to your transport. So to an extent, I remember there's a point, of course, where I would walk, say, from our office at Masaba to city center just so that I could just wind down. Now it meant that you have walked three, two or three kilometers a day and so if you don't really have a lot of a lot to put aside for a gym, you're actually saving, saving money on a gym. Um, carry, carry food to work. You spend a lot of money on restaurant food. If you're carrying something small for motors there yesterday, you have a savings. So if you count that every day I would have spent 200 shillings on a matatu, uh, but uh, on a 1,000 shillings on a car, I spend 200 on a matatu. You can say, okay, let me reward myself with 200, but then the other 500, what do I do with it? That is disposable income. That's money that you didn't have yesterday, you have created just by hab a habit change. I'm not saying it's only about matatus or carrying food to, to work, but those small, small habits, like um, we call it impulse buying, you need to look at them and see where is your money going. A good example is buying things from the middle shelves in the supermarket. That's where the expensive brands are because they are, those shelves are paid for. But just down below, there's another pamper that costs less. Of course, I know we have our pride. We say our children will only wear a particular type. But yes, sometimes you look at that and you realize that even walking around the supermarket with a calculator and looking at whether the bigger box of something and the smaller box of something are you buying at a cheaper unit price or if going to a wholesale is cheaper those small habits save you a few shillings and if you're talking about the hundred shares say in safaricom that uh, elizabeth was talking about you can create that 2800 by habit change and buy shares worth that 1200 every month for a few months you get the dividend you reinvest it you have just created what she called uh, you called um you know the, the 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 interest the compounded interest because you are investing your dividends and over time those habits will create a huge difference in your investing culture same thing with your savings culture thank you samuel elizabeth you're parting short briefly two minutes all right my parting shot is first uh Invest in yourself, invest in understanding yourself and uh, setting goals for your investment. Always set your goals and make sure that uh, you live to those goals. Don't give up on those. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry for that noise. Uh, so you invest on yourself, understand yourself and make sure that uh, you live to the, uh, to the strategy that you have put in place. If you don't understand anything, uh, take time and uh, go to your investment advisor to seek more information and always dig for funda, for for information from you for before you invest before you invest that's how you will not fall into these gold scams and things like that uh, by investing in information fact finding so always fact find don't just go in because the return is high and following the heart that is what i would say but most importantly information is everything, eliminate ignorance by all means. And for those of us who are in ISIFA, this is a good forum where you can get yourself sharpened every time and by involving yourself in the different forums that they are creating and their pages. I, I get a lot of information from the pages in ISIFA, so you can invest time to learn new things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. A kindly round of applause, just uh, raise your hand at the bottom of your screen just to uh, show that you're clapping and you're appreciating the kind of insights, the education we've gotten on investment basics, what one needs to consider before making an investment decision. I think now we are all more enlightened and we are wiser when it comes to making investment decisions. And for those who don't save, there's someone who's recommending a book called Read 
the richest man in Babylon by Clanson. It's somewhere along, we can get the book along Moy Avenue. So get those points and um, we believe that going forward, we'll keep on learning more and getting better in investing. I've been your host and moderator, Efe Diana Morioki Maina, the CEO of the Institute of Certified Investment and Financial Analysts. You can still go to our website, more information, more events coming up. I think we should be holding this at least once a month for the sake of just making people wiser when it comes to making investment decisions. So have a good night. Some of us are in the office. Kuna lockdown. We don't want to be gotten in the office at 9 p.m. So we appreciate keeping us company. Over 100 who had attended. We'll share the slides. The video will be uploaded on our YouTube page in case you still want to you read a few points or you missed a few uh, pointers or a uh, bit of information. So thank you all and have a good night. Please feel free to. Bye. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. It's been an honor talking to you.